So Richard, can you just explain very briefly and succinctly what the latest understanding, the current understanding of how, how the mechanism of evolution by natural selection actually works? The, the word neo-Darwinism is used as opposed to paleo-Darwinism or Darwinism. Um, Darwin knew nothing of genetics. Darwin's genetics, the, the genetics of Darwin's time was completely wrong. Everybody thought, everybody except Mendel interested. Mendel discovered modern genetics. He was a contemporary of Darwin, but Darwin didn't know about it. Um, in, da in Darwin's time, it was thought that uh, the, the maternal component and the paternal component blended rather like mixing two pots of paint. So you would get, say, red paint and blue paint, mix them together, and you get purple. Uh, and, of, of course, if you mix purple and purple, you don't reconstitute red and blue. Whereas it, you can tell, you can, I mean, anybody can see, that actually you do, in effect, reconstitute red and blue. So that's the big difference between neo-Darwinism and Darwinism. Genetics is particulate. That's to say, uh, genes don't blend. Genes are like, well, in Mendel's time, we would have thought of, thought of them as little balls. Now, of course, we know their, their DNA. The, that doesn't matter. The important thing is they don't blend. They remain intact from generation after generation after generation. Uh, genes are things that you can count. They have a frequency. In Darwin's time, there was no such thing as a gene. There was nothing that had a frequency. Heredity was governed by... They thought of it as a, like substances, mixing substances. There's nothing you can count there. The neo-Darwinian revolution, which sort of began in the 1930s and has, continues to this day, in, in neo-Darwinism, we have frequencies of genes. Every gene has a frequency in a gene pool and that frequency can change as the generations go by, and that is the modern understanding of evolution. The modern understanding of evolution, which is really a bit different from Darwin's, evolution is changes in frequencies of genes in gene pools. And the genes that are good at surviving are the ones that become more frequent in the gene pool, the genes that are bad at surviving become less frequent in the gene pool, obviously. And what does success in surviving mean for a gene? It means the gene is good at building bodies. That's how genes survive or don't survive. At any one time, we think of a gene pool as a thing where the genes are kind of being stirred around. But at any one time, the genes are all locked up in individual bodies. And the bodies that survive pass on the genes, so the genes that make them survive, the genes that equip them, equip bodies to be good at surviving, are the ones that become more frequent in the gene pool. And so what the result of that is that as the generations go by, what we see is bodies that are better and better at surviving and passing on genes. And the way I put this in the selfish gene is that an animal is a survival machine for the preservation of its genes. This whole concept of survival of the fittest scares a lot of people, doesn't it? And, and really religious people refer to it as, as being a, a recipe for barbarism and something that's going to unleash ruthlessness and, and terrible atrocities. Um, perhaps now would be a good time to have a look at our second clip from the series. But can Darwinism be applied to other areas of human affairs? What about taking back the reins of our own evolution? Don't copy nature, but control it. Speed up the elimination process. Once they have been born, detectives are happier and more useful in these institutions than when at large. But it would have been better by far if they had never been born. It's been tried before. The eugenics movement of the early 20th century aimed to stop the weak procreating through compulsory sterilization of the... ...unfit. Eugenics seeks to apply the known laws of heredity 
so as to prevent the degeneration of the race and improve its inborn qualities. Here was a slippery slope down to a nightmare. At its worst, eugenics became a dark tribal vision, ultimately used to justify ethnic genocide in Nazi Germany. With horrific echoes in Bosnia and Rwanda. I feel strongly that the barbarism that was the culmination of eugenics in the 20th century was atrocious. But it's important to say eugenics is not Darwinism. Eugenics is not a version of natural selection. Hitler, despite popular legend, was not a Darwinist. So what was he? Hitler knew about, like as everybody else did, knew about dom domestic breeding. I referred to this already. Um, what Hitler did was to attempt to apply the principles of domestic breeding, like dog breeding and cattle breeding, to humans. So he didn't get that from Darwin. What happened was that both Darwin and Hitler got the idea of selection from animal and plant breeders. What Hitler did was to apply it to humans, which Darwin didn't. Um, what Darwin did was to apply it to nature. What Darwin did was to substitute, as I said before, was to substitute nature for the selector. So it's an utter travesty to say that um, Hitler was a Darwinist. Hitler simply got the, got the same idea of domestic breeding as Darwin did, but did something very, very different with it. And it seems to be, to, to judge from your works, Richard, a bit of a travesty as well to suggest that natural selection can only bring out the ruthless uh, side of humans. Can you talk us through a little bit why that is? Because it seems a little bit counterintuitive. It's yes. such a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of That's theory. right. Um, I mean, my first book was called The Selfish Gene. A lot of people thought that it was, um, well, suggesting that we're all selfish, which it wasn't. And even worse, that we ought to be selfish, which it most certainly uh, wasn't. Actually, the idea of the selfish gene was to explain the altruistic individual. So the, the altruistic, nice, cooperative organism, animal, um, is explained by selfish genes working for their own selfish good, but for various reasons. For example, um, kinship, the fact that uh, there's a statistical probability of genes being shared among certain classes of individuals, like brothers, sisters, nephews, ch children, grandchildren. Because of that statistical probability, natural selection favors altruism towards close relatives. It also favors altruism towards potential reciprocators, towards other individuals who can pay back favors. And both those forces, both kinship and reciprocation, are fostered in small groups, small groups of inbred organisms who tend to meet each other again. And those are the conditions that humans probably lived in. So humans probably uh, inherit a tendency to be nice to each other because our ancestors used to live in small groups. Now we no longer live in small groups, uh, but never mind, we've still got the same desire to be nice, which has been inherited from that earlier time. <laughs>